Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our class, our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Daniel. We are already in chapter 3. And tonight, when faith is in the fire, lessons to be learned by all of us through Daniel's friends. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, for this study tonight. Bless it across the internet, into the hearts of all who have viewed it. Lord, may we take the lessons that Daniel's friends were exampling for us to learn here and put them into play in our life, Lord. Help us to shine in the darkness that surrounds us. Help us to be faithful, walking with you as an example for all to see into your glory. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. So last week we saw Nebuchadnezzar's dream was interpreted by the captives of Daniel and his three friends, and Daniel was elevated in position because of that. God uh, was recognized by King Nebuchadnezzar as being um, a very powerful God, not the one and only true God of only uh, the only way to salvation, not yet. But uh, he is at least recognizing there's a greater God that Daniel's serving than all the many gods that he and his people are serving. So some time has passed. And remember, this dream was about a great image made of, of different uh, metals that degraded uh, from the head of gold all the way down to the iron mixed with clay, ten toes of this image. Some great time has passed, I imagine. And then Nebuchadnezzar, like many people, soon forget God's blessings, God's mercy, God's greatness, being the creator of all. And um, we revert back to making ourselves elevated and even making ourselves our own king on our own throne of our hearts. And that's exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Because after this time passed, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, he made an image of gold. And the height of that image was 60 cubits, and its width was six cubits. So we see that this image of gold, probably inspired by the dream, probably inspired even more by the fact that God revealed through Daniel to the king that this head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, the golden kingdom. Any other kingdom that would come after it would be inferior. And we saw that play out in true world history. Through the uh, Babylonian kingdom, the kingdom of gold being defeated by the Medes and the Persians, the, and then, uh, the, uh, then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the ten toes representing a, a kingdom that we are now part of, the revived Roman Empire, that we see the hand um, or the stone cut out with, without hands uh, was dropped on those on the image, and it destroyed the image, and uh, destroying all the world kingdoms. It was all God behind the scenes making this happen, and the ten toes are that are crushed, the current culture, will happen very soon at the coming of the Lord for his bride, and then at the battle of Armageddon against the nations that have come against his, his, uh, his loved one, Israel. And so, that will enter into the age of the tribulation and the Armageddon and the new kingdom and the new earth. But it's probably been inspired by that head of gold that was Nebuchadnezzar. So he makes an image to be worshipped. Sixty cubits by six cubits, six being the number of man. Remember in Revelation 666, the number of a man, the, the, the number that the Antichrist will require uh, to be put on the forehead or on the hand, and uh, that will be necessary to work, to be identified as one that has allegiance to the Antichrist kingdom, that Jesus will soon, will soon destroy the rock kingdom, the stone kingdom cut without hands, uh, will destroy it. And so, um, yeah, so 60 cubits, uh, really the, uh, the length between the uh, elbow and the tip of the middle finger, uh, it's, it's a varying, everybody has a different length, but it's close. Uh, that would be a cubit. Uh, but anyways, it would be about 90 feet high and nine feet wide at the base, which would make for a very, uh, thin yet tall image and the image of gold. It probably wasn't pure gold, but I guess it, it's possible, not probable. Uh, it was probably gold plated. 
and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So, yeah, that's the scene that's set here. Now, I want you to notice throughout uh, the rest of this chapter and the rest of the book of Daniel, uh, the progression of faith that Nebuchadnezzar displays. Um, he had no faith in the God of Israel, uh, Daniel's God, in the beginning. And then we saw last week that uh, he at least acknowledged that God that was greater than the gods he was worshiping, but still among one of, uh, of, of many gods. And let's see how it progresses here tonight. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, just the fact that we have all these different administrators and governors, and we, we see that there's great organization in the bureaucracy of the Babylonian government. Um, and so uh, these satraps, uh, they were uh, in charge of fairly large areas of the kingdom, uh, down to the administrators, and then the governor, the administrators would be like lieutenant governors, then the governors, counselors, treasurers, so on and so forth, uh, down to the uh, smallest of responsibilities. But look how organized it is. It is the, the first major, major world power the scripture is recognizing here in its all its glory, the glory of man, that is. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of provinces, they gathered together for the dedication of the image that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. It's like a picture of the entire world. All different nations and languages and peoples were there representing. It's kind of representing our global um, culture today. Everything's global, isn't it? That at that time when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the God, worship the gold image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And he did set it up as a God. And it's a picture of him to be worshipped, I believe. I believe he uh, had that in the back of his mind also. And uh, I, I look at, as a musician, the lyre and the psaltery, these stringed instruments. You know, the lyre would be a uh, rectangle uh, box with strings on it, and you would use a pick, and it would give high tones. It would be a trebly type of uh, sound that it would make. And then the psaltery would be a stringed instrument, similar, but it would be plucked by the, uh, use of the fingers, and it would give it a more mellow, bassy sound. Um, so the low tones would be, uh, featured, uh, but then it says, and all kinds of music. So there's other instruments other than the horn, flute, harps, lyre, and psaltery. So all kinds of instruments, a full orchestra of sound coming forth, uh, in, in a magnificent glory to this dedication of this image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And so there's uh, been uh, ancient furnaces in that area in particular that archaeologists have uncovered, and they were able to um, find out that they were very tall. As uh, you can imagine, they had a vertical tunnel open at the top, and uh, there was a dome that was supported by columns covering that top to allow the smoke out. But um, charcoal, they found was normally used as a fuel to, uh, to uh, fire these uh, kilns or furnaces uh, in the ancient world. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so worshipping a false God through a man-made image. They were declaring their commitment to King Nebuchadnezzar, to the kingdom of Babylon, the government, and their willingness uh, to incur the wrath 
of the government and the king if they did not fall down and worship, swearing their loyalty uh, in this manner. So this was selling out. This was kind of like uh, the mark of the beast that would be taken by taking that mark in the end days that we're fast uh, in uh, approaching and uh, just about ready to experience. Um, it would be a sign of allegiance, identification. Everybody loves to identify with what they believe in. Well, you're going to have no choice but to identify with the kingdom to come here um, by Antichrist, by taking that mark. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. What we're seeing here is what we're seeing today, what's always been anti-Semitism. This is ancient anti-Semitism. Nothing has changed. These certain Chaldeans that are mentioned here, uh, they were most likely priests of the god Bel Merodach, who were um, probably young Jews, um, I mean, probably envious of the young Jews that uh, Daniel's friends here, um, having position in the kingdom, um, having favor in the kingdom, and here they're captives from um, from Judah. Uh, they should be slaves, and they are, but they shouldn't be uh, in government position of power over uh, native-born Babylonians. And so um, the Chaldeans, be very malicious, were accusing the Jews of disobedience, and you know they were. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not going to. Uh, fall down when the music played and worship this image. And it was well known by all that they wouldn't. They made it quite clear with Daniel that they served the God of creation, the God of Israel. And um, so their reputation went before them. And these guys didn't see them not bowing. They just knew they weren't bowing by their reputation. And, you know, what a wonderful testimony. And that should be our testimony. The world around us, our friends and family should know that we're going to act in accordance to God's word before any mandate, before any law, before any circumstance. We're always going to choose the righteous way, God's way. And that should be known of us as a Christian. There should be no doubt where we stand on issues. And God uses that to convict hearts and to bless hearts. So... These Chaldeans were so full of themselves and so sold out to Babylon and the king and his uh, agenda that they were probably representing uh, the, themselves as some sort of a master race. Haven't we seen that before in the Nazi Germany, right? And they were denouncing the Jews. They were resentful that these captive people were in positions of honor and power by the king himself. Anti-Semitism in the ancient world. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews um, whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And, and so we see the worship of your gods. Okay, so there's a spiritual connotation there, but the worship of the image, there's also a political uh, agenda there. There's two separate worships. The affiliation, the identification with the gods of the culture and the worship of the gold image, worship the leader, King Nebuchadnezzar, the political end of things. And so, wow, uh, we see a lot of heavy duty things going on behind the scenes that we know is being fueled by the devil himself. And um, but that, yeah, these men, that's how they're referred to. Notice that Daniel's not mentioned as part of this group. Um, now, we know uh, he he would never fall and bow the knee to this image, just like his friends. But uh, the only thing we can think of is perhaps he's on uh, on business call. He's he's uh, traveling. We don't know, but he is not here. These guys are are not going to budge. So they're rock solid, just as Daniel is. Um, but yeah, what a 
What a scene that's set here. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men. You know, they're just not even, no honor, no titles, no, these men, these Jews before the king. They're standing fast. Even uh, things are heating up in their life, and they're not even considering turning to the image. Not even an option for them. And that should be the same for us. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Is it true? Now, if you're ready at the time, you... He's given them a second chance. They are so valuable to him. He doesn't want to lose them. He doesn't want to kill them. But he's under political pressure. And the anti-Semitism of the day is screaming. The culture is screaming. This isn't fair. And you can imagine the protests like we have today with this uh, situation with Hamas and Israel, how people are taking the wrong side. It's not God's side. It's the enemy's side. And they can't see the forest for the trees. Now, if you're ready at the time when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, and lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, he's given them that second chance. And you fall down and worship the image, which I have made. Good. It's good. Everything will be okay. Just do it. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. He's got to save face politically. And look at this statement. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Boy, how soon he forgot the God of Daniel and his three three friends. How he was able to interpret the dream that no one else could. How he proclaimed that Daniel's God is greater by ten times. All his wise men and astrologers and soothsayers. You know... Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? There's an arrogance there, a pride there that is a direct uh, insult to God. You know, I was just woke up this morning and I looked at the news on the internet and a story just popped right off the screen. Here it is. This is a Turkish lawmaker who just yesterday Uh, had a heart attack after declaring Israel will not be able to escape the wrath of God. He was blaming Israel for all the woes over there with the Hamas situation and just everything's flipped upside down. And he believes in all his heart that he's on the right side. And he says, God's going to judge Israel and, and place them under his wrath. And he had a heart attack. Immediately after saying those words, he collapsed and was taken to the hospital. 53-year-old Turkish lawmaker in the news today. Check it out. God doesn't play around when it comes to his people. That's Israel and that's his church. And so we've got to support Israel with our prayers and uh, just watch those who don't. The countries that don't, the leaders that don't, um, the churches that don't, uh, and on and on and on, we'll see God's hand in action. May not as be as immediate as this, but his wrath is coming for those who are against his people. Wow. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now, they weren't being smart or disrespectful, but they had um, purposed in their hearts to serve God and to be faithful to God, just like Daniel did when it concerning uh, eating of the king's meat uh, and not desiring to do that because it was offered to idols. He wanted to honor God with that conviction. And of course, it was uh, honoring God's law for the Jews also to do that. Uh, They didn't have any defense for not worshiping. They didn't need to reconsider their commitment uh, to the Lord. They stood fast for God and the one true creator God and only him. And they understood that their lives were in God's hands and that no matter what happened to them, they were going to honor him. And so they, 
that's the, the context be behind their statement. We have no need to answer you in this matter. It's settled in, in our hearts how we're going to serve our God faithfully. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. They said it very re respectfully, very humbly, I'm sure. And in saying that, it just brought even more fury into the heart of the king. We've got to know that God is always faithful to his faithful children. And since we already know that, we need to put our faith into action, feet to our faith, and contend for the faith, even when the cost is high as death. Hebrews 11.35 showed an example. Uh, it says, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured. These are believers not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better, better resurrection. They had hope that this life wasn't all there was, but there is a life with the giver of life in eternity. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. We, we believe Isaiah was sawn in two were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Hebrews 11.35, powerful. The sold out nature of a man sold out to God or a woman sold out to God. Their attitude, as Daniel's friend's attitude was, you can't threaten me with heaven. We're in God's hands. He owns our lives, and he'll have his way with our lives. And if he wants us to stay here to be a testimony, no fire, fiery furnace or King Nebuchadnezzar is going to change that. But if he doesn't, he'll take us into glory. Either way, you can't threaten us with heaven. Either way, we have the victory. And that should be our attitude, especially as things are heating up around us in the culture today. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I mean, talking to the king like that. I mean, they're doing it respectfully, but you don't disagree with the king. Sometimes it's the will of God for his faithful to die in the line of duty. I mean, we are soldiers for Christ if we're in the battle. And that's how they were serving him with that attitude. As seen here, God's always able to deliver if it's his will. And they didn't ask for a miracle. And they expected nothing. They were sold out to God no matter what. And they had the heart of Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Remember, Job was just miserable, sitting on that ash heap, scraping his sores with the broken pottery and just in torture and a horrible, horrible health situation. He lost his family, his, his wealth, his good name, but most importantly, lost his health. Even so, he says, I will defend my own ways before him. All his friends came up to that ash heap as he was in misery, and they were saying, well, maybe you sinned against God. Maybe you have a secret sin. You're not telling us everything. What are you up to behind the scenes when the doors are closed? Something's going on with you that's not right. And yet there was nothing going on. He was sold out to God. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Should be the believer's call and motto through the hardest times. When things heat up, we should cling to God and our faith more than ever, knowing that we belong to him and he's in control. Our lives are in his hands. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He couldn't fake it any longer. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Well, he's not thinking right. He is so beside himself, so angry, so hate-ridden that uh, losing his temper, he's not thinking right. I mean, it would have made more sense for him to have cooled the furnace by seven times rather than heat it up. It would have been more torturous death, but he's like just 
incinerate them now, vaporize them now. It's not thinking. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fi burning fiery furnace. I mean, they basically already said they'd walk in the furnace and, and allow God to have his way with their life. And yet he's sending certain mighty men of valor. I mean, this would be the elite guard. And he's binding them uh, before he casts them. They're not going anywhere. They're not fighting. They're not trying to run away. They're not in panic mode. And yet, look at all this anger uh, that has uh, made these foolish decisions out of hate. Then these men were bound in their coats. Another thing that doesn't make sense. Bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments. I mean, he's loading them up with clothing. I mean, he's like, he, he's just rolling them up in, in material, thinking that that's going to make the punishment and the fire hotter, or I don't know what he's thinking. And they were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So... Yeah. King is very irrational at this point. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, wow. Can you imagine? I mean, they couldn't even get them up into the furnace without killing themselves. It was so hot. And notice it says it was up. that They took them up. I mean, these were giant tall tunnels. That's what they were unearthing. The archaeologists found that they were massive. And you had to go up an incline, and uh, it was straight down from there. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Well, what a horrible thing. And certainly they were had to have some fright upon them, but uh, they willingly went, placing themselves in God's hands. How would we have responded? You know, they already knew this principle that we have illuminated by the Lord in Matthew 10, 28. Uh, they understood that man's ability to injure others beyond the limit God has set they understood this concept because Matthew 10 28 the Lord says and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell so Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they had a healthy dose of the fear of God I believe Job did also do we we have to ask ourselves where do we stand in the fear of God department? Do we truly honestly fear him? If we do, we'll keep his word. Jesus says, if you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. And that's what these men were doing. All right? And so they fell down. They're in the burning, fiery furnace. And you know, God, he goes through the fires of life with us, doesn't he? Many of you have experienced God going through the fires of life with you since you've come to know him and he'll take you to a higher plane in your relationship with him once you get through the fire with him because your relationship with him gets closer and sweeter and more meaningful and you depend upon him more daniel's friends were in no hurry to get out of the fire as we're going to see they'd rather be in the furnace under god's control in god's hand than be outside the furnace in the hand of this irrational, hate-fueled, really crazy king. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to the counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt in the form of the fourth is like the son of God. It could be translated also a son of the gods, which is more in keeping with Nebuchadnezzar's concept of, uh, uh, of spiritual things concerning the God of creation at this point in time. He didn't, he seemed to only have known the 
uh, that the fourth person in there was a heavenly being. Uh, the fourth person certainly and probably, and I believe was, uh, a pre-incarnate showing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the third person of the Godhead, the Son of God. And so he's making that appearance here. What a beautiful thing. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke. Now, obviously some time had to pass. Obviously they're watching these men just walk around in the flames like it's just a nice cool summer day. Uh, and there's a heavenly being in there. The Lord Jesus is walking around with them. I mean, they're having a good time <laughs> being with the Lord in the fire. You know, you can have a good time with the Lord going through the fires of life too if you're sold out and trusting in Him, depending on Him, putting yourself under His influence wholly. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he went near. Now some time had to pass, and they've been watching this scene for quite some time because he was able to get up near the, uh, the mouth of the burning furnace and not die like his elite guard did. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God. Maybe he's having a flashback here of what he called God uh, some time ago when uh, his dream was interpreted by Daniel. But he's back to the most high God because he's never seen anything like this before. He says, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So we see another step forward in his faith he's not saved yet but uh and he's not disavowing all of his deities that he worships in the, his culture but he sees that the god of israel was higher and the most high god of them all well, that he is and his are non-existent He's got to learn that fact first, and so do all of us, that there's only one God, and it's not us or anyone or anything else. And the satraps and ministers, governors and king's counselors gathered together, and, and they saw these things. They saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected. Incredible, miraculous, and the smell of fire was not on them. Tell me there's not a God after seeing this come to pass. When God delivers miraculously, he does it completely, fully. These three men did not have their hair singed or even the smell of fire on them. I mean, we walk into a room that has some smoke in it. It's going to cling to our hair and clothes. Can you imagine the smoke billowing out of this furnace? The only thing that was consumed was the ropes that bound them. Think about that. The thing that bound them was consumed. God consumes the things that bind us, the sins that beset us. The burned ropes that bound them were the symbols of Nebuchadnezzar's unbelief and wrath. And they burned away on his captives. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies. Boy, nobody wants to yield their bodies today to the Lord, do they? They want to mark them up, pierce them up, color them up, uh, surgery them up that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. God honors that. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made in ash heap. It's going to burn their houses down if you don't worship the god of Israel today, because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Wow. Well, he's getting closer, but not close enough for saving faith yet. See, unbelievers cannot deny the power of God that's evident in a faithful believer's life. That's why it's so important for us to walk the walk as we talk the talk. 
have it match up, not be the hypocrites that we can so easily be. Nebuchadnezzar's rule was religiously traumatic, and so is our life when we're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You can look at that verse in Ephesians 4.14. 4, we're basically to know what we believe and believe what we know and to live it out. To be hearers of the word and doers. And God promotes us. Then the king promoted. Once again, they get another promotion since the one they got with Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was promoting them in the province of Babylon. So they got even higher positions. God wants to take you to the highest of all positions, a child of his, serving in his kingdom here and now and the one to come hereafter. And so we got some lessons here real, real quick. They're right on top for us. It's low-hanging fruit, but when things get hot, we need to remember a few things. God wants us to prosper. Don't you want God to cause you to prosper? Be faithful to him. Uh, ask God to help you with your unbelief. It's okay to have an issue with unbelief, but cast it upon God. And ask God to help you to rededicate your commitment to him. When things get hot, then you'll be able to remember to be true to God and not follow the herd. Not We need to make right choices. I'm going to put these up on the full screen. We can't let difficult circumstances lead us to be unfaithful to God. You know, Galatians 19 says, let us not grow weary in doing what is right. In a time of testing, it's easy to grow weary in doing what is right, but we got to remain steadfast. James says in James 1, 2, blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. So we also got to make right choices and stick with them, even when it's terribly difficult. Now, secondly, remember to entrust yourself into God's hands. I mean, physically envision in your mind's eye, just putting yourself in his hands, jumping into his arms. Because God is more than able to take care of us too. Hebrews 13, 6 says, it's a uh, that the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Whether God delivers us from our trial or not, we know that God will take care of us and bless us, just like he did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Third, remember God will be with you. God will walk with you through the fiery trials. Hebrews 13.5 says, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise from a God who cannot lie. And Isaiah 43, 2 says, I will be with you when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. God doesn't leave us alone. You know, that was written a hundred years before this event. And these three friends of Daniel actually fulfilled that scripture prophecy of Isaiah. And I'm sure they're not the only ones throughout history or will be even in the future. And then finally, number four, remember that God will come through for you. Like the three friends of Daniel, we don't know how he's going to do these things. That's part of the thrill for me. Through a miracle, through strengthening us to endure and overcome in the midst of a trial or Maybe it's not until the world to come, but God's faithful. He's going to come through for us. He made that promise to us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your ability, but with the testing, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So I guess let's learn from the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tonight. And be strengthened to endure and overcome just as they did. No matter what comes through our lives. No matter what loss we experience. No matter what pain that we go through health-wise. What, uh, what um, people say about us. About our, our good name. Our testimony. But we'll stand tall. And we'll allow God to come through for us to provide for us, to help us to endure, to provide a way of escape 
when we can't endure no more. He knows our limits. So whatever you're going through today, just know God's going to come through for you. Be faithful to God in the meantime through it all. and He'll bless us. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this lesson tonight. I pray we take it to heart, put feet to our faith, and live the word. Lord, we just pray for your protection, for your encouragement, for your um, blessings, and uh, Lord, for your uh, assurance of our salvation. Lord, I pray that everyone that hears this message would have already acknowledged that you died on the cross for their sins, that they're sinners in need of a Savior, and you rose from the dead after three days, and you during that three days you defeated death and hell and went to prepare a place in heaven for all who believe. We're all heading for an eternity. And I pray that everyone that hears this message will confess you as Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from the fires of eternal damnation, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We don't deserve any of it, but we thank you for providing it. And I pray you give people that hear this message the faith to accept it and receive, knowing that it's not works that please you, but it's by faith alone in Jesus Christ's finished work on Calvary that covers our sins and gives us in exchange for them his righteousness. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for coming tonight. Looking forward to seeing you Sunday at Shoreline. God bless you. Take care. Go out there and shine for the Lord.